The road from Quorn to Port Augusta was all curves and scenery, but I was in no mood to be boy racer after a few drinks the night before for St Paddy's Day. Naomi had told me of a site I should check out just before Wyala, Wild Dog Hill. It was eight kilometres off the highway and apparently played a significant role in the traditions of several Aboriginal groups. The site was part of a dreaming story about caring for babies and obeying instructions. It's all morality tales in the end, whether it's the Bible, the Koran or the dreaming. How to live your life right, if you want to be in our tribe. The rust-coloured hill jutted out from the surrounding flat landscape. Several rocks had the appearance of faces, but at least that's what I was trying to envisage. It was nice to be able to get off the main road and check these places out and know I had the machine to get back to civilization. I foolishly asked Naomi if Aboriginals believed in ghosts. I suppose I was still thinking about my experience at the Pioneer Village. She told me her people moved along the creek beds and sure enough, if you had done something wrong, the mysterious Kadachi men could secretly move through the country like spirits, leaving no trace in their emu feathered footwear, seeking retribution for wrongdoing. I rode on to Wyala, which like Port Augusta, was a one-trick industrial city. All bad news. The steelworks closing. The town's future in question. I then hit the flatlands, straight roads that stretched to the horizon. You then take a turn, and then another straight road, stretching to the horizon. The landscape is flat and uninspiring. I took this route because I was lured by what the tourism brochures called the seafood trail. Each way around the coast, I was starting to feel it was a gimmick. But I suppose at least these roads will prepare me for my next challenge, a Nullarbor, a 1200 kilometre stretch of nothingness. After a solid day of riding, I started looking for a place to camp. I headed towards the coast, not really knowing what I'd find. I came across a little place called Point Gibbon that had a campsite, but it was full of grey nomads and their flash caravans and brand new, fully decked out four wheel drives. I actually feel safer and prefer to camp alone. I just like being surrounded by the sounds of nature. So I ride on down the coast and find a great little track that leads me to the edge of the continent where I watch the sun slowly set light up the sky. I then ride a little further on and decide to set up right on the beach, the sound of the surf lulling me to sleep. Camping on the beach is actually not that great. You get sand and everything. But as always, when I leave, I leave nothing but footprints. I finally arrive in Port Lincoln, the seafood capital of Australia. Time to get busy eating some of the sea's bounty. Straight away I get some Coffin Bay oysters, which I devoured there and then, using my pannier as a table. I then decided to book into a cheap hotel. I needed a good shower and wanted to have a base in town from where I could walk around. As I headed up the stairs I passed an Aboriginal woman with a pack of smokes in one hand and an asper spray in the other. A good combo there, I said, and she replied through a mouth of broken teeth. Oh, I need me fags. It's funny how we can be so critical of others' health choices and maybe ignore our own. I plan on having a few cleansing ales that night to wash away the highway dust. I'm sure of a vegan CrossFit running freak saw me sitting there alone in the bar, nursing my pint. They would probably have looked on me with the same pity that I looked on that Aboriginal woman. The room definitely was cheap. The carpet looking like a previous tenant had used it to do an oil change on a small motor. I'd hate to run a black light on these sheets. I headed to the shower and ran it cold for a bit to liven myself up. Someone entered the bathroom, speaking loudly on their phone. A man with an effeminate, over-exaggerated manner. He then entered the shower cubicle next to me and continued speaking loudly for all the world to hear. Oh God, why does he think I want to hear his conversation? And why is he in the cubicle next to me, causing his blaring voice to echo even louder? I finish up and go to the basin to clean my teeth. He has now moved from the cubicle to the toilet and stumbles out the door with his pants down, revealing designer underpants. Oh, sorry, he says with a stupid giggle. He's a young guy. Baseball cap back the front, skinny, dark skin, and what looked like a basketball singlet. He started talking about his parents not wanting him to go into the pokies. I gave a friendly nod but really wasn't that interested. I was tired after my day of riding and just wanted to relax. I didn't have the energy for such a tireless extrovert. 
Why was he annoying me? Why couldn't he just burn off all that narcissism by becoming a daily YouTube vlogger or something? As I headed to my room, I realised he was in the room across from me. Oh boy, I thought, that could be trouble. On my quest for local seafood, I went up the road to a local Italian restaurant and devoured a seafood pizza with local prawns and calamari, washed down with a cleansing Cooper's beer. I went back to my room and drifted off to sleep pretty early. At 1am, I was woken by my exuberant neighbour. Seems there was a bit of a party going on in his room. It's cool, I thought. It's Saturday night. Things will wind down soon, but they didn't. It seemed every 15 to 20 minutes his door opened and slammed shut. Either the poor guy had a raging case of chlamydia, or he was a local drug dealer. By 5am, I was ready to strangle him. I got up and went to the toilet, hoping to get the chance to ask him to tone it down a bit. Of course, for that time, he was as quiet as a mouse and didn't leave his room. So I get up the next morning feeling pretty cranky. I head down to the docks to find out about the shark cage diving Port Lincoln is famous for. These aren't pissy little reef sharks. These are the kings of sharks, huge white pointers. I was told it was the wrong season for the great whites and satisfied my wanting to do the tour by watching their promo video playing on a huge TV behind the reception. GoPro has changed everything. Anyone can do video now. I feel like a bloody blacksmith. My 20 years of experience making videos superseded by technology. That night I was happy to be camping out in the bush again. But I must be honest, I still had all my toys, a laptop, a phone, but I did feel I was starting to slow down, appreciating the chance to relax. Who knows, I might even start reading again, like I planned to do before I started this trip. The next morning I saw fishing boats heading out of the harbour to a golden dawn. This place had money. You could see it in the fishing fleet. You could see it in the houses on the water. Time to hustle and make some moolah. I rang some tourist businesses and there was some interest in video, but the timing was wrong with Easter just around the corner. But the response was promising. I didn't feel like a beggar here like in Clare with the mum and pop wineries. These people deal in tourism. They understand the value of marketing. But I was happy to move on. One can't fight the moment. Just accept it. There'll be other times to find work. I'm doing something many people dream of doing. I'm a traveller in my own country. Just enjoy it. Take it as it comes.